just an announcement in case you haven't seen the notice on the bulletin board. I'll have to see the dentist this afternoon, so there will be no meetings in the afternoon. And if you have signed up for a group, please sign up, sign up in another space. This is day two of the April 95 seven-day retreat in Springwater. Most questions or comments that have been brought up in meetings have been about thought and thinking. Thinking is the, the thought process that is going on at the moment. Thought we refer to as what is already registered or stored in memory and springing up very fast through all kinds of trigger mechanisms. Something is reminiscent and there is a thought about it associated in the brain or body or both. Because brain is part of the body. So people have reported enormous thinking activity going on, enormous thought, outpouring of thoughts, some of them, as one person described, very not even emotional or intellectual, just random stuff, as it seems. One person mentioned it happens so fast, there's so much of it, it can't even all be discerned, one can't see this thought and this and this, it's just a mass of it. Like a blizzard. Who can see the snowflakes in a blizzard? One person mentioning having, uh, during a sitting, a problem coming up at, at work, I believe it was, and thinking some about it, and there was a solution to that problem at work. So, thinking can't be all bad. Because it has a function with thinking about the possible solution, the, the problem abated. But the, the larger question moving people coming to retreat, particularly during the first days and at times unexpectedly, that maybe there was a period of some quietness, some abeyance of thoughts, and then springing up into action later again, inundating the body-mind. So the, the, the major concern is what to do about this, how to be with it. It seems impossible to be with it or not to be with it. And of course, having heard and read things by spiritual teachers or texts, usually the bottom line is the, the, the fewer thoughts the better. The best is no thoughts. Then there may be enlightenment or liberation or peace, peace and quiet, if these thoughts stop. So thought 
becomes the enemy of the meditator. Actually, I read once in a Tibetan text, by beginning to become aware of what goes on in the mind, one recognizes the enemy clearly, which is thought. I, I hesitate, not just hesitate, I don't talk about it this way, I don't think about it that way. Because enemy is a loaded term, emotionally, mentally loaded. I shouldn't have enemies or I know what to do with enemies, I ought to attack them, conquer them. So can one, in, when one does describe to oneself or to another one's condition, can one remain as factual as possible with a description? Careful not to get into emotion-triggering language. Or if emotions are triggered to see maybe for the first time or again, for the thousandth time, how thoughts trigger emotions and how emotions like anger, fear, jealousy are kept going by thinking about something, someone in the past. To see that connection is very important. It is no possible, possible way of separating thinking and feelings and emotions. They're all interwoven in one fabric of our moment-to-moment -moment being. So, sitting down quietly, not talking, with each other, because there's plenty of talking to oneself, quietly. And this barrage of thoughts and thinking going on. What is one to do with it? How is one to deal with it? I'm ever asked for suggestions. Is there a practice how to deal with thoughts? Because there are practices, thought control or mind control practices. Meditation practices of concentrating on a word, on a thought, on an idea, on a location in the body, on a koan, or a mantra, a repeated repeated syllables or a, a mandala, an image. And in trying and learning to concentrate, to keep the stream of thought under control, which is a tremendous effort. Because there's tremendous momentum to, to thinking and emoting. and therefore effort to stay concentrated, undistracted, which again implies the need for fighting distractions, controlling them, ignoring them. The more one tries to ignore, of course, usually the more whatever one is trying to control wants to intrude. So it's not, it's not suggested here in any way that one have a practice to control thinking in any way. Of course it's marvelous when thinking slows down, quiets down or abates. But there is something that happens not out of willpower or control. It happens on its own at its right time. What, what I see as our being here and, and, and see 
sitting alone and together quietly for a week or whatever amount of time one has made possible. What I see as the essence of it is to be in the midst of what's there. Maybe for moments of, ta for moments of time with an open mind and heart. Open meaning, open listening, being not in conflict with whatever is there. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, pains, wishes, fears. To be in the midst of it. I think we touched upon it the very first night. To be quietly present in the roar and, and, and tumultuousness of our inner being or what seems to be our inner being. Of course, you could immediately say, what do you mean by that, to be quiet in the midst of noise and uproar, upset? What does it mean to be quiet in the midst of chaos? By being quiet in the midst of chaos, I mean and all I can do is say all the things it is not. It is not objecting to it, fighting it. And carefully aware of all the objections that come up, the resistance to the thoughts and feelings. And by a glimpse of awareness of resistance or fighting, it's possible to let go of it. Nothing needs to be fought only become transparent, and it does that on its own. When there's a, a deep understanding that fighting ourselves and each other only leads to more of the same conflict. And that we can observe as we watch our day in, day out, living alone and with each other and watching others live together. So, to be quiet in the midst of, of the chaos of thoughts and fears and desires and just the silly randomness. Means not really knowing what to do with it. I could fight it, but I've tried it. I've tried it many times. I tried it all day yesterday. It didn't work. I tried to accept it, to be, to be loving, accept it, accepting of my thoughts. It doesn't work either. I tried to concentrate on something else, and it seems thoughts are multiplying. Or else, as one person put it, it's not that quiet that happens. It's not a real quiet. It, it is supported by enormous willpower and effort and doesn't have any space to it. So I've tried that and everything else. So now I don't know what to do in the midst of chaos. I feel rather helpless about the whole thing. Not as a, an incendiary storyline, how, how poor and helpless I am, help me. But the fact, I don't know what to do. And if I ask for help, it isn't, it isn't coming either. Of course, somebody's giving a talk right now. Is that help? We're, we're doing something together, looking at the fact that we're quite helpless in the midst of our condition. 
right now. I'm talking about right now, not when you get home and have an office problem or family problem. We're not talking about that right now. So let's not bring that in and evade escape from this moment here of sitting in the chaos of, of thinking and noising around, emoting, paining, fearing, wanting, humming, and truly not know what to do about it. Because it is becoming quite clear, if only for moments at a time, that whatever I do to get myself into a better place is more of the same. I wanting. And not in touch with what's really here in all simplicity. A few birds calling the breathing in and out, in and out. Distant traffic sounds and a bit of wind and thoughts upon thoughts upon thoughts, sensations, emotions, the whole thing is there and need not be tackled. All it needs is take up the space and time that it takes up anyways. With here and there an open eye of just seeing, not trying to alter. Yesterday we talked about just listening. Right now we said just seeing. It's the same thing. It includes the senses, but it is also more than the senses, because it has no I position in it. By I here, I mean the capital I. Oh, when I said a little while ago, an open I, I meant E Y E. I have to be careful, these words. Depending on what mood one is in, one just sees that open I there, ready to receive. So, a moment of openness of listening, hearing, seeing, without a position taken for or against. Is it possible a moment of no position? Just the twittering of birds and, and cars and breathing and heart beating? and some painting somewhere, wherever it is. Sound of the motor. Sensations of sitting, hands touching wherever they are touching. The whole thing. with no position. Because we're sitting different places. I'm sitting here and you're sitting here, there, and you're sitting over there and back there. But it, wherever it is, it's always in the middle of the whole thing. Without taking Sides is a better way of putting it. No sides taken. Not trying to accomplish something. Co accomplish 
banishing the chaos. It's there for a good many reasons, which date back to maybe before the Big Bang. Here we are, wind howling and birds singing, breathing, hands touching. If for a moment I don't think of myself or about myself as this or that, just the, the sound of someone moving or the wind catching in the eaves, the words that are spoken. for a moment of listening, which means the energy gathering right here, right now, this instant. For this moment of open listening or seeing, there's no need to think about myself. It happens quickly enough, does it? Or doesn't it? But if it doesn't happen, then there is no one there. except this organism functioning miraculously on its own, with no one at the controls. We think we are, but we're not. It's just idea. So can we grasp ever so fleetingly? Doesn't, we're not asking for any permanence. Grasp ever so fleetingly that feeling myself very much here in the middle of chaos also needs thinking of, about myself being here and what I ought to do with it, what I have failed to do with it, what other people have done with it, how poor I am at it, how good others are, or how good I am at it, how I exist in time, maybe in the future I'll get it, I haven't gotten it in the past. grasp ever so fleetingly that the I is constantly created and recreated in thinking about myself. And one instant of not thinking about myself is just heart beating and pain throbbing, wind howling, birds singing. Looking and listening, not out of an enclosure, but this living, vital, palpitating body, part of the whole movement of energy, if you will. and thoughts occurring in that living space. Thoughts arising from personal memory, from collective memory. Certainly a lot of it deposited in the brain, maybe most of it, who knows, where thought all resides. Maybe in memory fields outside the brain traveling maybe like radio or TV waves. Because certainly we find ourselves partaking and participating in thought which goes on around us. Thoughts transmitted by words and so forth. the most uh, frequent and s strong, strongly motivated thought is that of an enduring, or hopefully enduring I, enduring if not in this life, then in future lives. And 
the attachment to that thought and image structure of me. Tremendous attachment. Let us begin to appreciate the strength of this attachment to me and my life, my world. All right now, at this moment, a matter of memory and thought projection. Is that memory and thought projection? Or just tweet, tweet? There it is. So we're, we're touching on this every day in a talk. Questioning what this I is, which feels so caught, so attached to itself, in thought. So afraid and so full of wants. And memories and anticipation. So invested in itself through thinking and emoting. When not, do, do I sound condemning? Maybe one already hears that. Because I speak with some intensity, and it may be interpreted as the intensity of condemnation thing, saying you shouldn't have that, get rid of it, be ashamed of it. Of course, none of that is implied here, <coughs> even though the way. I'm talking may be interpreted that way. All we're doing here is bring things into view through looking and talking about it at the same time. And wondering whether it's possible to, to be in the midst of this chaos of ongoing thoughts and their contradictions, the opposing desires. Wanting to be free of anger and at the same time wanting to be angry. Wanting to be peaceful at the same time loving to fight. Just naming a few uncomplicated inner contradictions, but we're full of them, and some of them very complex, not just one or the other, many different ideas tugging at each other. You, you watch it yourself, it's, it's all there. Maybe the moment we stop trying to fight it, or get rid of it, or, or bemoan the fact that there's so many thoughts on day two in retreat, Become a little bit more aware what it is that this mind is constantly bringing up in thought and wish and fear. Just to, to see it at a glance. Needs no comment. Of course, comment is our habit. So I'll be commenting on it. And that too can be seen. Often getting more aroused by the comment or the way we comment about something than by the thing itself. which is what happens in editorials or newspapers of an incendiary kind. By editorializing about an event, we become all excited. The event we had already forgotten. So, is it possible from moments at a time to become aware of the whole thing, the, the kind of thoughts occupying the mind, the kind of emotions connected with it, the reactions to it, opposing reactions, <clears throat> talking to oneself about oneself and getting all excited over it, over either the sob story or the glorification of ourselves. 
to watch it. At the, at the moment of watching, there's no need to make any more out of something that has already been made by thinking and reacting. Seeing is very sparse, very austere. It just sees and in that lets go. Whereas the, the commenting doesn't let go, it keeps chewing and chewing and chewing over something that happened. And therefore continuing the emotions, the fears, the angers, the jealousies, or the lust or pleasures. It's an amazing, miraculous thing to, to witness, if you will. How quickly an event, a happening, comes and goes if nothing is made of it. And nothing is made of it if the habit to make something of it is watched, is detected. The most effective if it's detected right in the beginning, seeing the, the, the habit to now go into this and make something of it, make a story out of it. It's seen instantly and it doesn't have to continue because it's seen at its very inception. When it's already gone on for a while, it can be seen just as quickly, but the, the body is already very much involved in the emotions that have been aroused by the story. And bodily sensations and feelings don't go away quite as quickly as a thought can come and go. Particularly since the way one feels gives rise to new thoughts about feeling the way we do. Not seeing the connection, what has caused it, the commentary, the story. But now worrying about, why do I feel so upset in my stomach? So the physical sensations aroused by memory and thinking and association have a direct effect also on the brain. To react to that, to like it or not to like it, to worry about it or even to get into panic states. We all know that, how worrisome thought can augment, feed on itself. This will last forever. What if it lasts forever? And imagining something lasting forever, a pain, a disability, or whatever. And, but there's always something beyond that. There's something beyond the panic something beyond the pain, beyond the story. And that's seeing it, <clears throat> being aware of it this moment. beauty of being aware this moment of all the stuff going on in this body-mind at the same time hearing the wind which has been there the whole time. Maybe one didn't hear it at all. The birds, the breathing. Without the need to make one thing out of it.
We will end here for today.